you have your Bibles today, turn with me to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Uh, I'm teaching through the book of Romans, uh, but I'm not skipping chapters, okay? <laughs> if you were here last week, we were in Romans chapter 8, uh, but uh, when there is a special occasion, uh, we, uh, you know, go to other places, and it just so happens to be uh, what the Lord led me to was Romans chapter 13. Today I want to talk to you about being a Christian citizen, a Christian citizen. And if you have an outline and a bulletin in your uh, hand there, uh, we have an outline that we'd like you to fill out if you choose to do. And let me give you the outline. Number one, a Christian citizen obeys all authorities. Obeys all authorities. Folks, authorities are important. We have to have authorities in our world. Number two, a Christian citizen is a Christian example. We as Christians should set the example of a, what a sit, true citizen is. And number three, a, a Christian citizen loves their neighbor, loves their neighbor. And these three things uh, I want to point out to you today uh, in our scripture. You know, our founding fathers did not believe in the separation of God from government. They believed that this nation was founded by God, protected by God, preserved by God, and blessed by God. It all depends on God. And based on that belief, they were willing to pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. They put it all on the line. Of those 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, nine died of wounds or hardships during the war. Five were captured and imprisoned, in each case subject to torture. Several lost wives, children, or their entire family. One lost his 13 children. Two wives were brutalized uh, by the British. All at one time uh, uh, or another were victim of man hunts and were driven from their homes. Twelve signers had their homes completely burned to the ground. Seventeen lost everything they owned. Indeed, these men not only pledged, but gave their lives, their fortunes, and not one went back on their sacred honor. The nation they sacrificed so much to help found uh, is still intact for us to enjoy today. Matter of fact, history tells us that 52 of the 56 men that signed the Declaration of Independence were Christians. God established three institutions when, when he created uh, this earth. Number one is the home. He established the home. Two, the government. Somebody has to run our world, folks. And number three, the church. And that's where we come in. So today, I want you to see what it means to be a Christian citizen. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Obeys all authorities. Let every soul be subject to the govern, governing authorities. And folks, you have to realize, in Paul's days, the Romans were the ones running things. And you look at the history of the Roman Empire, and it was a great empire. But as in all things, there were great leaders, and there were not so great leaders. Even in the time that Paul was writing, Nero was, was one of the leaders, and he was... He was a terrible man. He was bloodthirsty. He, he literally burned Christians uh, to death. He, you know, the persecution of the church and all that was going on. So you have to understand that God, he, he may not place them in order, but he allows leaders to happen. He allows those things in life. You think back in the Old Testament of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, I mean, they... He persecuted uh, the children of Israel, all right? But God used him to discipline also the children of Israel. So we, as Christians, have to understand we have to have governing authorities. We need people in place. What if there were no laws? What if there were no leaders? Then it would be total chaos. So it says, let every soul be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. God allows these people to lead. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 
Nothing catches God by surprise. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authorities resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And folks, I, I'm not saying we have to agree with everything and all that is going on in our nation, but I've been to four third world, world countries, and I am telling you, there is nothing like living in the United States of America. Everywhere I went in those four countries, the main thing when they got up in the morning, they were looking for two things. They were looking for wood to make a fire, and they were looking for something to eat. Folks, we are blessed. No, I don't agree with everything that's going on. Matter of fact, there's a lot that's going on here, and I never thought I would see it in my lifetime. But that doesn't mean we rebel against authorities, okay? They are put here. For instance, take, take the police. We need policemen, okay? And why? Let me ask you this question. Why, when a policeman comes up behind you, you put on the brakes and you slow down? Probably because you were speedy, okay? Why do we have speed, laws for speeding? Do you see what I'm saying, folks? They are here to protect the people. They are people in authority. We need to respect our law officers. We need to pray for our law officers. They are doing us a great service. And by the way, they put their life on the line for you and I. Anytime a policeman or woman leaves their home in the morning, that spouse has no idea whether they're coming home that night because of all the senseless killings. Yes, there are many things wrong with America but we need authorities in our life according to the Word of God. And we should not resist or disrespect authorities. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror, of good, terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. You notice the people that don't like authorities? Those are the ones that are breaking the laws. And they are. And folks, we need to respect authorities in our world. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good. And folks, you can argue with God on this, all right? There are people, and again, even in politics, in politics, I don't agree. I don't, you know, as far as, you know, one or the other, or, I, you know, I understand everybody's different. But whoever is in authority, we need to respect them because they were God allowed them to be there. And there is a lot of good going on also. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he who does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And folks, that's why we have a court system. And I understand not all trials are fair. I understand that there are times that injustices happen. But it is the best a system that there is. And, and we need to obey all authorities that God has put in our lives. For instance, uh, in Acts chapter 5, look at Acts chapter 5 with me if you would real quick. Acts chapter 5. I want you to see what was happening with Peter. Remember, Peter and John were arrested, and they were arrested for preaching the gospel. Is there, any, is there anything wrong with preaching the gospel? No, there isn't anything wrong with preaching the gospel. And basically, they told them, you cannot use Jesus' name. And in this, uh, you know, Peter stood up in verse 29 and says, but Peter and the other apostle answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And folks, there are times when you can go against uh, authorities when it is morally and ethically wrong. For instance, I think this is going to happen, and it might happen in my lifetime. I think there's a chance that the government eventually is going to tell us pastors and censor us pastors and tell us what to preach and how to do it. And folks, this pastor will not obey that authority. 
I will preach the Word of God word for word no matter what is going on. And I understand what it will cost me. But when I think of the Apostle Peter and especially Apostle Paul and what they stood up for, folks, it will be worth it. It will be a testimony to who we are in Jesus Christ. So yes, we obey them until they go astray. First Peter, uh, First Peter two. Look at First Peter two. Peter even gets on gets gets on this. First Peter two. Look at verse thirteen. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Why you are representing Jesus Christ, whether to king as supreme or to governors as though who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So we need to do good, and, be, and being a good citizen is doing good. Being a Christian citizen is doing good. For this is the will of God. Paul says we need to do it. It's almost a commandment the way Paul puts it. And Peter says it's the will of God that you are a good citizen. And by the way, folks, don't gripe about who's in office if you did not sign up to vote. We can be a voice, but you have to vote. You have to vote. It's so, so important. For this is the will of God, that doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And folks, he's talking about the lost. The way we uh, are, you know, act, the way we do, the way we are as citizens. We influence others, and the lost world should see that we are Christians as free, which we are free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for a vice, as the bond servants of God. Folks, we, we are God's representatives. We are servants of God, and we need to do that in all that we do. Now look at verse 17. Honor all people. Folks, I don't care what color their skin is. I don't care what they're wearing on their head or how many piercings or tattoos or whatever is going on. Honor everybody. They were created by God. We can worship together. Honor, God, honor the, all the people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. That means respect God. And honor the king. Folks, I have no problem with peaceful protesters. I have no problem with them but I have a huge problem with those who protest and break the law. January the 6th, I could not believe what I saw. That is not the way to do it, folks. According to the Word of God, that is not the way to do it. Black Lives Matter, folks, there is not a prejudiced bone in my body. I love African Americans. I have great friends that are African Americans. But what they did in their protesting, burning businesses, and all that was going on there, folks, it's wrong. Even way back when abortion clinics were being bombed several years ago, that's not the way to do it. I understand it took 50 years, folks, but God helped us and did a work and abolished abortion, abortions. And we praise God for that. So we, as Christians, have the duty, the obligation to obey all authorities. The second thing I want you to see, the second thing is, not only should we obey all authorities, we should be in a Christian example Look at verse 5. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. What is Paul talking about, conscience sake? I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying because it's the right thing to do. Folks, we as Christians need to do the right thing. We should not have hate in our hearts for anyone. We should not be prejudiced. Okay, we should not show disrespect to people for conscience sake. And we are different as Christians. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Just treat people the way Jesus treated people. 
Folks, he ate with the sinners. He hung out with the tax collectors. Why? Because he knew all of them need salvation. And we are a, refle we are a reflection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are different. We have Christ in us. We have accepted Christ. We have called Christians believers. And we need to show Jesus to a lost world. Look at verse 3. For because of you, uh, because of this, you should also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. And I was told when I was a youngster by my grandfathers, there's two things that you will always do, young man, as a citizen of the United States. You will pay taxes and you will die. Okay? Those are the two things. Now, nobody likes to pay taxes. But folks, I'm telling you, they are there. We need, uh, you know, the income to run our country. Again, I know there's corruption. I understand that. I understand even in the welfare, welfare system, there is corruption. But it's just like our food bank that we have, all right? We don't, you know, just, we don't refuse service to folks that come in. And I know sometimes we're being taken advantage of. But I'd rather be taken advantage of and not, or, for, you know, and not feed a hungry child. Listen to me, folks. It's, it's not the children's fault that these parents don't have food. And we will, as long as I am pastor of this church, we will feed the needy and we will feed children. It's the right thing to do. Verse 7, Render therefore all, that, all their due, to taxes whom their taxes are due, to customs, uh, to customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. And basically, Paul is just saying, be good to people. Treat people. Follow the golden rule. Treat them like you want to be treated. And folks, there is a lost and there's a dying world out there. And they need Jesus Christ. And sometimes we can use food to present the gospel to those folks. Even our mission trip that is leaving of this week to go to Fort Worth. Many of them do not understand and do not know the God uh, that we serve and the God of this Bible. And we are going down there representing people. And instead of having to go to these third world countries, God has placed these people into our country and we have a ministry. And, and I'm not talking about the illegal aliens, folks. That's not right. The, le the illegal part of that. But if they come in in the right way, we need to treat them with honor and with respect. Colossians 3 says this. Colossians 3. The Bible says, And whatever you do, listen to that, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you say, any action that you have, do it in word and deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, the Bible says if we give a cold cup of water in Jesus' name, it will be rewarded according to the Word of God, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Well, folks, we are God's hands here on earth. We are God's eyes here on earth. We are God's feet here on earth. We are God's mouth. We represent God in everything we do. And we need to be a Christian example to others around us. 1 Peter says this. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It means guard your minds, be sober, be serious about your assignment. We are soldiers of Christ. Then it says, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust. I call former lust my B.C. days, before Christ. 
Folks, I don't want to be the way I used to be. I was lost. I just thought about myself. I didn't care who I hurt. I didn't care what I said. And I know many of you weren't that way. But I'm telling you, we don't need to go back to our past. As in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Folks, I know we're not perfect. I understand that. But we should be holy. When you think of God, one of the deals about, when when I think of God himself, one word that I think of is holy. Our God is holy, and we are representing him. So we, according to this scripture, look at the last part of that, be holy for I am holy. Folks, the bracelets that we had and that we have, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And folks, if we would treat others, if we would treat people like that, I am telling you, it would be a better world in which we live. So we should obey all authorities. We should be a Christian example. And then the last thing here is we should love our neighbors. Our love, love our neighbors. Look back in our text. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. Now, just a little sideline. There are people that use this for, for being debt-free. Folks, that is not in the flow of what he is saying here. He's talking about Christian love. I think it's good to be debt-free. I think a goal in our life ought to be debt-free. But I'm telling you, you would not be sitting in this building, you would not be sitting in this air conditioner today if our church had to be debt-free. It means pay your bills. Pay your bills on time. Okay? Don't charge. Back in those days, they charged interest, just crazy interest stuff. It was unfair and they treated the poor, and they would literally throw them in prison if they couldn't make the payments, okay? He says, oh, no man, anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. What did Jesus come to do? What does the Bible say? Fulfill the law. Yes, the law is a guideline. Yes, we need laws in our lives, but laws will not save you. The law The law will not save you. The Old Testament commandments, matter of fact, he even says them here. Look what he says. For the commandments are, you shall not commit adultery. What did we say? Except to love one another. Folks, if we love our spouse, we won't commit adultery. We know the hurt and the pain that it causes. You shall not murder. Hey, if we love people, we're not going to murder them. Do you see how love trumps Even the law, love, we'll obey the law. You shall not steal. If you love me, you're not going to take from me. You're not going to take from somebody. Man, folks, the Bible says in 1 John that God is love. The very epitome, he is holy and he is love. You shall not bear false witness. If you love me, you're not going to lie to me. You're not going to lie about me. You're not going to gossip behind my back. You shall not covet. And all these are summed up in the saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. And the question, which we'll answer here in just a minute, who is my neighbor? Folks, it's not just the person that lives next to you. It's not the person that just lives in your cul-de-sac. That is your neighbor, but it is far more reaching than that. Look at verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Folks, I am telling you, Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he was telling them how important love is. John chapter 13. I want you to look at two verses there. Jesus speaking and he was talking about how important love is. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you. Why was it a new commandment? But what, was, what would the old law say? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What did Jesus say? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Could you imagine what this world would be like if everybody just loved one another? You look, turn on the news. It's full 
of hate. Hate, hate, hate. Hate leads to anger. Anger leads to death, folks. They kill. Do you realize you are not safe anywhere now? You are not safe in our building. Now, we are doing everything we can to keep you safe, but they broke into churches. Why would, why would they do that? Why would somebody go into an elementary school that school and just start shooting people up. I can tell you why. Because of hate. It's all around hate. And so Jesus is telling them, I cannot tell you how important it is to love someone. And you know what I believe with all my heart? If anyone walks through the doors of our church and they sense that they are accepted and they are loved, they will come back. Everyone has that capacity in them to love and to be loved. And so many people have been burned earlier in life. Situations that got out of control or upbringings that were not godly. And folks, our job as Christians is to love our neighbor. Why? Because Jesus told us to do it. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, you also love one another. How much did God love us? He sent His Son to die for us. How much did Jesus love us? He put His hands on a cross and died for us and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's love, folks. That is the example of love. Now look what it says in verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Love one for another. Look in our text again, Romans 13. Actually, look back, look back to verse 12. Look to verse 12. Look at verse 12. Romans 12, verse 18. If it is possible, okay? You know what my Bible says? With God, all things are possible. And here's what you say. But, but Mike, you don't know, okay? Did God say you can love people and you can hate others? No, that's not what he says. You need to love everyone. If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Folks, it happens in families. You know what splits most families? Money. It's money. Either a business deal or someone dies and they get all upset and now people aren't speaking to one another. I know an example in Lawton to where two people in our church in Lawton were not speaking to one another over a tree in their yard. Are you serious? A tree. Now again, I'm, you know, I understand... We need to take care of the environment. I understand all that. But I'm going to lose my fellowship with my neighbor over a tree that hangs over in my yard? Folks, we have to be like Jesus. We need to get along with everyone. We need to be the bigger person. God tells us that this is what we need to do. We need to obey the golden rule. And then I want to go back to who is my neighbor? Turn to Luke 10. Luke 10. And I close with this reading. Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And again, tested. You're not going to test Jesus, okay? That's like testing God. That's like trying to be smarter than God. Okay, not a smart thing. And he said to him, what is written in the law? What are you reading of it? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. See, we're real good about most of the first part. Man, I love God. Man, he's in my heart. He's in my soul. He is my strength. He is in my mind. But my neighbor, that might be another issue. Who is your neighbor? Let me give you an example of your neighbor. Anyone you run into, anyone that God puts in your path is your neighbor. 
But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And the man answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. (laughs) Does that not sound like our world today? It goes on all the time. Folks, there's nothing different going on today than there were back. You can just go back in history. You can go back in biblical times and find the same thing going on. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And I realize priests and even pastors are are busy, but should we ignore people who are hurting? Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and came and looked and passed by on the other side, a Levite, you know, he was the one that kept the church going, all right? He, he had duties in the temple, and, uh, you know, he, he was that chosen tribe and all that. He had good intentions, but yet he ignored this bleeding man. But a certain Samaritan, and folks, Samaritans in those days, they were the outcast of the Gentiles. I mean, Christians and Jews, or excuse me, Jews in those days, some of them would just, they would literally go to the other side of the uh, the street not to have to come in contact, uh, even eye contact with a Samaritan. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. What is compassion? It's love. It's love. Let me ask you this. What if it was you laying on that road? What if it was your kid or one of your kids laying on that road? What would you want those people to do? So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. He brought him to an inn and cared for him, and on the next day he departed and he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come, I will repay you. He went the second mile. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. You know what mercy is? That's love and compassion. What would Jesus have done? He would have stopped. The only difference between you, me and you and Jesus is Jesus probably would have healed him right there. That would have been a cool thing. But we, we, that, we don't have that ability, but we have Christ in us to help this person. 37, and he said, he who showed mercy, then he said unto him, go and do likewise. You say, Brother Mike, why are you bringing this up? What, what's the deal about the neighbor? Do you realize that every neighbor, everyone is our neighbor, and everyone is a prospect for our church? Everyone is a prospect for the kingdom of God. You know what we need nowadays? We need relational evangelism. We need to sustain a relationship with people that we don't, that we don't know so that, that, that they will trust us. They will trust us and believe us so that we can give our testimony to that person and possibly lead them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I wonder how many prospects we have. I wonder how many lost people we have in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I can help you out a bunch. A bunch. So folks, everyone is our neighbor, and we as Christian citizens need to be good neighbors. Father, thank you. Thank you for the love that you have shown us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for always being there. And God, I pray that we, even as we celebrate our freedom, God, I pray that if there's one here today that doesn't know you, that today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that we as Christians would be Christian examples to people around us God, I pray that we would be that good neighbor. I pray that we would show compassion and love to people. And God, I pray that we would be busy inviting folks to our church. God, when we see somebody hungry, I pray that we would feed them. 
when we see somebody hurting, that we would speak to them. When we see somebody really ailing and, and, and grieving in a loss or in any way, Lord, I pray that we would step up to the plate and minister to them. We are God's ministers here on earth. So God, I pray that we would make it a point to be good Christian citizens. God, this is your time. This is your invitation. Maybe some Christian needs to rededicate their life to Christ or come for baptism or even join this church by letter. They know if they've come more than once, they know who we are and what we're about. So God, would you just speak to our folks through the Holy Spirit? God, we love you. We praise you. We need you every day of our lives. So God, I pray you bless this decision time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet, those who can? Stand to your feet, and if God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.